It's a great honor for me to be here in this stage. Uh, my name is Ivan Moreno. I'm the co-founder of Plasticity Degrees, a uh, creative studio based in Bremen, here in Germany. And in this talk, you're going to see what is the relationship and the similarities between these two images. The correlations between art, science, and engineering, what I have encountered doing real-time 3D projects, uh, share tips on managing a large amount of data, the downsides of a very diverse distribution landscape, and why having so many options can overcome us, overwhelm us as creatives and how to best overcome them. A little bit about myself. I study fine arts, design, and engineering. I did uh, two specializations, one in digital edition and multimedia, and another one in digital media, media informatics. Uh, we have been building tools in our studio that help us to create our projects and help as well with the e-commerce tools of some of our clients. Um, we have been working with across different industries and make some prototypes of WebGL for the community. Coming back to these two images, how do you think they are in any way similar? Any ideas? They both start with black canvases. GPUs are machines that perform 60 or 120 times what it took a Renaissance, a Mannerist, or a Baroque painter between three to 10 years to succeed. It gives me, I like to treat it this way because it gives me a scope of what, how far we can get in these centuries. It reminds me that WebGL 3D frameworks and game engines use, in fact, many of the math developed since then in perspective and geometry. Concepts as vanishing point and other ideas used for many years are placed within their math systems. The introduction of the camera obscura and optics made us rich here. Artistic forms were created with those new developments thanks to the technology developments at the time in optics. Keroscuro modeling appeared inspired by Greek illumination models. And we have been using them since then in the production of painting, images, and films since the Renaissance. Chiaroscuro modeling, the art of creating volume by placing light on dark. Also called light modeling, light shading, or simply shading, is where we have to look to understand computer graphics. Chiaroscuro painting is a negative version of regular painting when you take a carbon or an oil paint and stain on the, on the white canvas. In works of Da Vinci, Rubens, Velasquez, Velasquez, Baglioni, Vermeer, Rembrandt, Caravaggio, you will find all these concepts, and among other painters. We have a, they had a virtuous understanding of the craft as a general and how to create that imagery, how to mix the colors and how to, the light behave, what brushes to use depending on the material they needed to be resembled. Rembrandt, Velasquez, and Caravaggio they were a little bit better because they managed to create their art in big canvases, something that it was not really possible due to the technology that it was used at the time. Something, this doesn't mean that uh, other classical periods, they were not continuing with the development of their art. Um, they continuing until the Industrial Revolution when the introduction of the photography and film was introduced in our society. And painters start to diverse their, their art forms into different mediums. And into the 1970s, some group of artists recreated the concept of hyperrealism to resist the main photography, the mainstream photography in the arts. And GPUs, does, the GPUs do that process precisely with math and physics. Knowing what brush or paint texture to take and to use in your art will define your final imagery output and your audience. But how GPUs do all this? A little explanation of how GPUs work might be relevant in this case. There are two sides that you need to take care. The vertex buffer or geometry buffer, and the fragment buffer, or pixel buffer. As the name describes them, one 
handle the geometry buff, uh, data, and the other one handles the fragment data. Both are interconnected by uniforms and attributes that move da data types between both buffers. And you can transform them any single time in virtual space and in virtual time. The amount of data that is loaded to these buffers charges the performance budget. So you have to be careful in the way how you are going to create your assets and display it in their application. Find a balance between them. Otherwise, the application might suffer the risk to get blocked by the browser for user security or user experience issues. How do we create those assets to have that balance in your application? First, I'm going to explain about the 3D modeling capturing. There are multiple methods, methods to create, but one of the most popular one is photogrammetry, where you surround your object with multiple cameras and capture the images of that object and then get all the data points and put it in your modeling pro program. There are two ways to do so. The cylindrical that uses a hexagonal surround, like in the picture, and the planar aerial, where you take some drones and you place some cameras, cameras on it and you scan all the field that you need to. This, this, this method is great to create complex environments. Racing games, tracks are done this way for video game consoles, for example. And cylindrical photogrammetry are done for human bodies and more complex shapes. And other ways are direct laser scan to the object. The, the, this method is pretty great for reverse engineering on some objects uh, and is used, very useful for the creation of cars or other objects that are in industrial production. The most classical one method to create the objects is by volumetric topographic from blueprints. It's precise. It gives less noise, data noise within the correction, but it takes a lot, a lot of time to optimize, so it's not cost effective compared with the other two methods. Once you have all that, you're ready to remove the excesses by running some tools in your 3D modeling tool, and you take out the vertex quality, and then manually, your 3D team required to arrange those vertices that they are get mis in misarray and place the normal vector perpendicular to the quad or triangle in order to have uh, accurate representations of lights and reflections in the surface of your object. The creation of textures is also important and is used methods like with photo cameras as well. When you take a photograph, the, the photograph of the texture that you want to replicate and adjust it in an image processing tool like Photoshop or something like that and adjust the values of the illumination in all the pixels and accommodate it for being able to be tileable. Once you have that texture, you can reduce some information from the, their channels and then you can create other textures like the normal maps or the bone maps and so on. The way how you arrange your your, these textures in your shader program are going to transform the, dif the different out visual output. So you have to be careful how you arrange them, and you have to play with those textures and adjust them. And you will see how the final material is going to be represented in your display. And for that, it's necessary for you to have some understanding of shading programming and the rasterization methods of your 3D rendering engine, whatever it is. It's important. Photorealistic 3D are large applications. So you have to treat them like big applications in JavaScript. Uh, they require many data. So the loading process can be long. There are many presentations already in this video, confer in this video conference where you can take information into of how to create the large applications. But the generally speaking, the advice will be the same. You have to reduce the server calls when loading scripts and assets as much as possible. Load first scripts and styles. Load then textures. I like to initialize the fragment shaders after, right after I finish loading the textures and create the materials. And right after that, I will load the, jata, the, the geometry data. 
and initialize the vertex shaders and, uh, and wrap those geometries with the fragment shaders previously created. I like to follow this path because the creation of, the, of, bo of both buffers is very heavy for the machine. So you can crash the application, and your experience can get broken at that point. Once all this process is over, the rest of the journey is going to be very smooth. Creating lighting is important because it adds volume to the objects to the scene. And you need to have a lighting model that is going to be uniform in all the materials. PBR, as smart as it is, is not as smart as just dragging and drop a file format and having a triple A graphics out of the box. Indeed, it gives you some advances, but you have to play with the values of your materials until you find the right balance of it. We will see that some materials, when the light is getting too close, the material is going to get over illuminated and going to burn, and on other materials, they're going to get very opaque, and they're going to be flat, looking very flat. So play with those values, and you're going to be find your balance in there. One of the good things about PBR is that it contains previous models like Lambert illumination or Fong illumination. So those illuminations give some visual artifacts for you to play when you don't really require to have all the, the textures in the in this, in that PBR requires. Precompute illumination on textures, as known as um, bake illumination, is also a good performance tip. Usually, we use that when the, in a level design where the camera is not going to get so close to the um, environment or the area that is going to be displayed. And it's a, way, a great way to save resources that you can use in another areas of your application, like in the product configurator, the object that it requires to look realistic. Um, in product configurators, the lighting model is fixed and is a little bit more easier than, than the walkthroughs, for example, or in game design, in level design, because the, the light is fixed and you can surround it with your camera all the time. So the, there's no need to move the cameras for uh, the lights for all the time when the camera moves, like in the walkthroughs. Some engines cool both the geometries and the lights. Others, they just call the geometries. So depending on that, you choose what illumination to take. And my recommendation is that you have to go to target uh, three, a minimum of three lights and a maximum of six lights, uh, including the sunlight if you are building um, the scene. Balance this mm, with the material properties, and that will be giving the, to you more performance uh, space for the load more geometry textures. Post processing is important for very visual results. It's a second layer of the process in the pipeline, but it's expensive for the machine. But it gives you another advance because you can have an extra layer of color, color correction or illumination and adjustments of, of pixels. You can transform at this point with the fragment shaders your image, since it's, it's rasterized already by the, by the renderer. It's in one single image. And you can apply any type of models in there, like uh, neighboring pixels, pixels. And you can um, transform, make it more bright, move them into, into dimensions, and create all these ecological effects that developers like to do. Play with those values until you find your final imagery and you are happy with the visual look that you have, that you want to desire. Um, now, the vast diversification of hardware has brought us great opportunities, but at the same time, stillness. Because finding the next path to take can be hard. Waves of misinformation due to these many mediums uh, we're expecting to happen. And we are a little bit confused in how to move around in the development process. There is an order of developments that needs to be addressed. I recommend first to step, uh, the first step to target uh, mobile and desktop. And based on that, move to other mediums. 
I'm going to speak about precisely with virtual reality and augmented reality in mobile, with mobile devices because it's what it might come faster and reaches more audience. And the reason why it's this order that I recommend is because if the application doesn't perform OK with your basic configuration options, it's not going to perform or look the same neither in your virtual reality or augmented reality application. And all my previous comments that I have done with modeling and creating textures and how to arrange your application are useful for all these mediums. In virtual reality, it's not that easy as just to divide the screen per each eye. Uh, that comes with attacks, and you have to play with, depending on your application requirements, how high that, that task could be and make some compromises. Mirrors, for example, is another complex part of the virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, because you have to have many cameras in, in rendering, and the hardware is not going to support that. All the 3D rendering frameworks that exist and game engines in JavaScript, they come with controls for easy integration. So you can, programmatically wise, can create those controls easily. In the case of AR, reflections can be hard as well, because we can have access to all the dimensions of the environment once the user is on a specific uh, geographical position. You don't have access to that. So most of these applications, they have the uh, pretty compute uh, reflections, uh, textures. So the visuals are not going to look as great as if the application were going to be developed in indoors environment. The lighting is also very difficult for the, that reason, for similar reasons. And we cannot have access to the illumination that is happening in the outside environments. If it's cloudy, if it's not cloudy, if the sun is at what specific time. So that affects the final output. And that is something that it can take some time to, to reach to have high fidelity, like in indoors developments where you have control of the illumination and control of the, how the environment looks. So the application can look very OK with it. This um, approach, for example, work to advertisement billboards, uh, artworks in art galleries, or, or dealership presentations in dealership stores, or retail stores, and so on. Be careful with the amount of data that you're going to use in your augmented reality application because you have to allocate some memory for the camera rendering, which is going to be in high definition. So that's some cost in there as well that, is going, that you cannot use for your 3D data, plus the, ge the geographical position tracking system. It will take some memory, and that system, we are going to get the plain ground where we're going to address our development of the scene. And as conclusions, Chiaroscuro is deeply embedded in computer graphics. The relevance of art influencing technology is not just in selecting colors, typography for the interfaces. Adjust for computing tones when possible, because that opens space for more data to be computed. And more space for data to be computed means that you have more room for improve your graphics. The way way to learn is getting information from other doers, whether by books, documentaries, presentations, scientific papers, etc., and apply those concepts with trial and error experimentation. Target mobile first, desktop after, and later other mediums. What's next for photorealism in web technologies? Well, we are following close what video game consoles can do. We expect to have better ray tracing methods and more accurate illumination models in the future. More virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality adoption is happening and is expected to increase. 
Use WebGL or hardware accelerated APIs for 2D and 3D rendering as much as possible, because with that power at your disposal to be used, you can render more data or analyze more data. Don't be afraid of it. Dig into it and use that power to extend your design and artistic capabilities. I hope that I brought some useful information to you today, and I cleared some questions you might have. This is a pretty extensive topic, and it's hard to fill it in a 20, 25 minutes talk. If you would like to keep talking about this, you can drop me a line at my email address, or you can write me on Twitter. We can talk about this, or something that I call that net art hyperrealism, the rules of it, the manifesto that I have, been, I have been written, and the future items. Thank you so much for your attention and for being here after the great party last night.